Welcome to the Roberts Law Office Injury Podcast. Kentucky attorney Jeff Roberts has over 25 years of experience. He'll provide answers to your questions related to personal injury and automobile accidents, workers' compensation claims, and Social Security disability benefits. Let's join Jeff for this episode. Friends, this is episode eight of the podcast with Jeff Roberts. And Jeff, uh, th- welcome back to the studio today. What's interesting is uh, we're going to talk about some good news, I think, is the fact that here in Western Kentucky, we are absolutely blessed with a lot of new facilities that have opened up. Obviously, COVID's had a little bit of a of a slowdown on us, but there are a lot of things happening in Western Kentucky that, uh, that also, unfortunately, might lead to some extra injuries, which could involve you from a workers' compensation standpoint. Exactly. Yeah, we have uh, had some new businesses uh, locate here, and with the thing with COVID, uh, other businesses are reopening back up. Yeah, slowly, uh, from that standpoint. Yes, yeah. exactly. And you know, hopefully, the economy will be going full blast again for too long. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, we, we have been at least holding our own, so to speak. Here, right. Well, and I know one of the things that happens typically when a plant opens is obviously from a worker's compensation standpoint, you're helping an injured worker who was in the course of doing his or her job, gets injured on the job, and Kentucky has a worker's compensation system out there that compensates them and if they need time off, if they need uh, retraining, if, if possibly even they can't work any longer, this all comes into play. So you're heavily involved with a lot of a lot of workers throughout the region here. And it, again, you're based out of Murray here in Callaway County, but that's not really where your practice stays, correct? Correct, yeah. I handle workers' compensation claims all over uh, all over Kentucky to some extent uh, but the uh, all over western Kentucky for sure probably uh, the well the majority of my clients are uh, most likely are uh, outside of Callaway County right. uh, from the total standpoint I, I may have more Callaway County as a percentage of any other county but when you combine everything Callaway would not uh, is not more than 50 percent of my practice for sure wow and, and that's the fact that you've been practicing for over 27 years now here in this area so obviously you, your reputation's grown your your uh, exposure your uh, interactions with other attorneys who may actually refer cases to you because I mean maybe you're a little bit better suited for a particular type of case right uh, certainly I have uh, attorneys all over Kentucky actually refer workers compensation claims to me uh, attorneys out of Louisville that uh, frequently refer uh, workers' compensation claims an attorney out of uh, northern Kentucky that uh, that I know that called me up and personally asked me to handle their family members' workers' compensation claim up in northern Kentucky. So I, I have experience handling those claims all over the state. And in fact, you've actually been invited as a speaker to present at various, uh, let's just call them professional seminars, where there are attorneys in the audience and you're up there actually talking to them about how to practice these cases properly. Correct. Yeah, I've, I've spoken uh, as a wor- uh, uh, training uh, other attorneys on how to properly handle workers' compensation cases at, at legal seminars throughout Kentucky. Uh, University of Kentucky, uh has a workers' comp seminar that I've, I've spoken at, Kentucky Justice Association, Kentucky Bar Association. I've spoken at seminars for them and, and some other organizations as well. Uh, in fact, I've been asked to speak by the Ten- Tennessee Trial Lawyers Association to speak on workers' comp uh, down there. So let me, it's fair assessment. You kind of know your stuff in this field. So let, let, I, I, <laughs> just I, little, at least I think I do. <laughs> somebody seems to think so, right? Yes. Well, let, let's talk about these new facilities because, I mean, it, it, it's exciting when the new business opens up, especially if it's a new plant and, and there's new procedures, policies, and operations. But that means sometimes the kinks aren't always worked out, and especially if you're new to that facility, things can go wrong. And, and what, what might actually happen there? Well, exactly. When when a new facility opens up and you know, the workers come in, it's not a job that they've been doing over and over again uh, in, in no the physical requirements of it and know how to, to safely perform the job. And, you know, the ergonomics may not have been completely worked out. Hopefully they've worked that out in the process of, of uh, designing the facility itself. But, you know, when workers come in and they're doing job tasks that they've not done before, you can you can cause injuries if they're lifting weights heavier than what they've lifted in the past or lifted recently in the past anyway, or they don't use proper body mechanics. Uh, they can cause a back injury, a neck sprain, uh, or you can have... You know, overuse injuries where if you're doing the same activities with your 
arms over a period of time, you can have overuse injury to your wrist, Those shoulders, elbows. Those motion type things, yes, right? Yeah. exactly. But according to management and the engineers who designed the process, it looks great on paper. It, so, you know, obviously. The, the, the ones who aren't doing the job think it works wonderful all the time. <laughs> right, right. Unfortunately, that's not always true. The um, So when you're wa- when you're walking into a, a, a new facility, a new plant, I mean, obviously you brought up ergonomics. And some of that could be the space in which the operator has to turn or to or to actually complete the job task at, at point. And if they're bending in, in awkward angles or they have to reach over other equipment, I mean, I, w- I would think you're going to get some back and neck sprains and probably some knee injuries, things like that. Are, th- are those fairly common in terms of workers' comp injuries? Certainly back injuries and, and neck injuries are very common and, and knee injuries as well. And, and from that standpoint, you see that in an ergonomic situation, a job that, uh, you know, one I see frequently for shoulders and necks is jobs that require people to uh, put uh, fairly heavy or you know, at least uh, weight-wise items up overhead, uh, putting it in bins or wherever it is, stocking, uh, whatever. Uh, you know, In our normal everyday lives, we don't tend to repetitively lift 20, 25 pounds overhead. And, and I've represented clients who's had jobs where they were doing that activity maybe a thousand times a day. Not not that kind of weight, but they're going up over their head that frequently in a day's time. And some of those weights are heavy weight. And over a period of time, you're going to wear out body parts doing that. Well, I would think, especially if you haven't built up that muscular structure, and again, you're just kind of new to the job. I, I would think some some strains and things like that when you're reaching over over your head with that amount of weight. I mean, that that's got to. I mean, you've got you know all sorts of different things. If if something happens, and, and I I start to notice that, hey, wait a minute, something doesn't feel right, or maybe something popped or tore or something like that. What should I do? Uh, well, the first thing you should do is report that injury to the employer. Uh, in, in fact, you're required to, right? Under, under Kentucky. Kentucky law requires you to report the injury as soon as practical after a work injury. Now, uh, and I've seen employers tell their employees, injured workers, that, well, you didn't report it within 24 hours, therefore we, you, know, we, you can't pursue a worker's comp claim anymore. That's not the law in Kentucky at all. But I've had clients come in and tell me that that's what their employer said and, and I proved their employer wrong in those situations but the uh, it, it doesn't mean that you have to give notice immediately but the best thing to do is to give notice immediately to the employer once you realize you're injured now uh, frequently people will think well I just you know I, the, the muscle sore it, it'll go away in a day or two yeah, I just tweaked it yeah it tweaked it and and, and, and frankly I think we're going to see that uh, occur frequently now that we're starting to reopen from the COVID because people who were doing that job beforehand and, and knew what they were doing and their body was used to doing that job, they didn't have any problem. They've been, you know, they may not have been at work for a couple of months. Now they go back and they start doing that task and, and they think, well, it's just, it, it's just a sore muscle because I wasn't used to doing that. And that may be the case. But uh, I've frequently had clients who thought they just had a sore muscle, and it turned out they had a herniated disc or a torn rotator cuff. Right. And sometimes the employer's telling you that, hey, you've only got 24 hours because that's our policy. Their policy doesn't really matter. It's the Kentucky law that really is the governing principle here, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And, and, and again, the, in the company's defense, this may be we just misunderstood, and I'm a new supervisor because, again, it's a new facility. You really need to understand your rights as, as an employee, right? Correct. You need to understand your rights as a, as a worker. And when you've got a company telling you something like that, you need to reach out to an experienced workers' comp practitioner who can tell you what the law is. Well, you, what happens now when the, when the uh, company says, okay, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you may be a little hurt here or whatever. We're going to, uh, we've got a doctor we want you to go see. Um, that happens. That that happens, and in, and in, uh, in, in like the notice that you got to give notice within 24 hours isn't correct. In Kentucky, the employer cannot tell you what doctor to go see, and, and that's one of the biggest complaints that I have seen in my career is. Uh, the person comes in to me and says, well, they sent me to this doctor and I don't like him, but they tell me he's the only doctor I can see and I, I don't trust him. I don't don't want that doctor doing surgery on me. And in Kentucky, they cannot dictate what doctor you go to for treatment. 
uh, you can go, you get to pick your doctor. Now, Kentucky does allow a workers' comp insurance company to have a managed care plan for work injuries. Most don't in Kentucky, but they do allow that. And if they have a managed care plan, you have to stay with a doctor within that plan, but you still get to choose which doctor within that plan that you want to go see. And, and they have to have a variety of doctors within uh, that plan, within you know, cl reasonably close proximity to you. Uh, they can't force you to go to, you know, if you're injured in uh, Murray, they can't force you to go to Louisville to see a doctor. They have to have doctors that are reasonably close. Uh, and, and if they don't, then you most likely would be able to go outside of that plan and be able to see a doctor closer to you. Right. But even if I were to travel to see a specialist of some sort, that mileage and if I need to stay overnight and stuff, all of that is covered by workers' comp, isn't it? Yes. If, if you uh, mileage for medical treatment purposes is uh, reimbursable as a medical expense uh, from the workers' compensation insurance carrier, uh, and, and that can build up to be oh, yeah. a, a decent amount of money. If you had, you know, a lot of a lot of the injured workers here will be treated in Nashville. Down at Vandy uh, or someplace. Yeah, you know, they go to a neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon down in Vanderbilt, and, and we've got excellent uh, neurosurgeon and orthopedic surgeons in western Kentucky. I'm not uh, advocating people go to Nashville, but, but some people are more comfortable going to Nashville to a, a specialist like that. And you run up and down where you're going to see that doctor every six weeks for a period of time, you're going to run up a lot of money and mileage going back and forth. Well, and that's that's one of those things that if if I'm injured again, I, I tweak something, or maybe maybe I have to take a few days off. I mean, I should probably call you or a workers' compensation attorney fairly quickly in this because I, I would think the company might threaten some pushback or might even threaten to terminate me if I don't report back to work. I mean, can you intercede on my behalf at that point? Yes, I can and do uh, frequently. If your doctor has you off work, you need to stay off work. What you will see is. Uh, the insurance companies will start sending a, a, a nurse to your doctor's appointments uh, for you. Some insurance companies do that, and, and that nurse will uh, – they, they can be beneficial because they help coordinate care and get things approved quicker, but they also uh, frequently will try to get the doctors to release uh, a patient to go back under certain light duty restrictions and things of that nature. And, you know, if the doctor says you can go back light duty, then then you need to return back to work light duty if the employer is going to accommodate that set of restrictions. Uh, but, you know, you need to follow what your treating doctor's advice is on what you need to do from a work standpoint. And again, workers' comp has a system of benefits set up to do that. They have the, the temporary total disability, TTD benefits, and then they have other things. But that's probably the first thing you're probably going to see. Is that, is that right? Right. The, uh, the two first benefits that you're going to uh, run into with it when you have a work-related injury is medical. Uh, is the first as a general rule because most people see it. Well, you always see a doctor before you're taking off work. So the medical benefits in under workers' comp, there's no co pays, there's no deductibles. You, you should not have to pay anything out of pocket for prescriptions or for medical treatment. And then the next is what's called temporary total disability benefits or TTD, uh, commonly referred to. And uh, that is basically weight loss benefits. Uh, if you are out of work, uh, they will pay you uh, 66 and two-thirds percent of your average weekly wage, uh, which is fairly close to what most people's bring home pay is as a general rule, and there's no taxes taken out of workers' comp. Uh, it is subject to a state maximum uh, uh, rate on what they have to pay uh, there, but they should pay 66 and two-thirds percent. You have to be off work seven days before you become eligible for that, uh, it, but you, you know, and after you're off, uh, 15 days, you get the first seven days paid. But most people, when they're taking off work, they're generally going to be off work longer than two weeks. Well, in, and that's when, again, these, these accidents, these injuries tend to be a little bit more severe. Maybe you've got a broken bone. I mean, I, I know you've got a testimonial on your blog from a, a gentleman who actually had a foot crushed, I think. And, and again, these things happen. I mean, these are catastrophic injuries that can happen on, on either at a job site or in the workplace in a, in a plant. Uh, and things like this happen with, with regularity. But in a new facility, 
again, the risk is everybody's still trying to get used to everything. And it's, you know, it might be a forklift that comes around a corner and doesn't, is not used to really operating around a lot of people, or maybe something got left in the way, and now suddenly you have a collision or some other kind of accident. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Any type of, whenever you're doing new activities, there's going to be things like that occur. You're not familiar with the facility um, uh, from that standpoint. I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it on any of the podcasts before, but when I was at Murray State University, I worked at the breach and Stratton plant that uh, unfortunately is going out here in Murray, but was here in Murray at that time. You know, when I first started uh, working there, you know, the the job duties I was doing operating the press uh, was it's the first time I'd ever done that. It was extremely odd to me to start with. After doing it for a couple of years, I could do it in my sleep. Uh, it seemed like, you know... For I, the record, you should not do that. I, I, you don't operate a punch <laughs> press in your sleep, for sure. But, you know, it was just, you know, I, I, it, it just become kind of automatic on what I was doing, and, and but I was doing it automatically in a safe way because I'd learned how to do it safely and to do it quickly. Uh, but when you first start, you, you've got to work through some of that process, and, and unfortunately, you can get injured in doing that. Well, and that's that's a, an interesting topic that we want to talk about, it. and it's not necessarily that you're lifting something heavy or straining something, but you're just getting used to the equipment, and, and just you're trying to develop that muscle memory and kind of get in that rhythm. And again, with a punch press or something like that, I mean, again, there's, there's, you could, you could have a, a loss of a limb or, or something serious happen to you or a coworker, right? And, and that becomes, you know, some of the risk here. And again, everybody's just trying to get used to, to getting this thing up and running. Well, um, there's that little company, that little organization called OSHA, and obviously they're there to kind of make sure that things are, are working properly as well. Talk to me a little bit about um, OSHA and what they, what they do, and how they can get involved in, in this type of, uh, this type of claim, maybe. Uh, well, uh, Kentucky has an, an OSHA uh, department that uh, is responsible for safety in the workplace from that standpoint. They've adopted pretty much, uh, I don't think pretty much, they have adopted the federal OSHA standards uh, uh, for workplaces, which set certain safety requirements in different facilities, in different type settings, different type industries uh, from that uh, standpoint and the facilities are supposed to know those and supposed to be complying with those and unfortunately they don't always do that um, and that can result in some very very significant injuries if, if a guard is removed off of a, a machine or if they are moving a machinery in an improper fashion uh, a variety of things that can come into play that are violations of OSHA standards and you know, if if they violate an OSHA standard, then the uh, that can affect what the injured worker receives. It can increase what the injured worker receives under the Workers' Compensation Act because there is a penalty to the employer if they violate the OSHA standards, and, and vice versa. There's a penalty to the employee if they violate a safety statute or if they violate a safety. A rule of the company that causes their injury, then, then the the injured worker could actually be penalized. So they, in the statute, has the Workers' Comp Act has that in it for a deterrent effect. They want to deter employers from violating OSHA regulations, and they want to deter injured workers from violating safety uh, rules as well. And, and again. It's not wor- the the injured worker who's just sustained an injury doesn't need to be worried about that. That is something that you are going to uncover as you start to investigate kind of what happened and what went on in the records and things like that. Video, if there happens to be video in, in the plant or, or wherever this may happen, they don't have to really worry about that. But the fact that you have ex- an immense amount of experience dealing with workers' compensation and pers- potential OSHA violations, you know what to look for. Right, exactly. I do. And, you know, OSHA, the the state OSHA uh, department doesn't come in actually and investigate most accidents in Kentucky. If it's a fatality, they always come in. If it's a very serious injury, they they're usually called in on those as well and should be called in on those. Uh, you know the the but but the back injuries and things of that nature, they're normally not called in uh, from that standpoint. And I've had you know, I, I've had clients that 
work at heights and not be tight, not not have the proper personal protective equipment that they're supposed to have. So I'm it, up on an elevated platform or a scissor lift or something like that. And exactly. I'm not, I'm not tied off or something. Not, not tied off uh, there and then suffer a fall. And, and, you know, I've had situations where OSHA should have been called and they weren't called. And by the time, you know, I've had when clients come to me and I say, you know, we need to get we need to get OSHA involved in this and I've reached out or had the client reach out to OSHA to report the injury, but you know, at that time sometimes it's too late for, for the state OSHA department to come in and do a proper investigation. But that doesn't prohibit me from having uh from talking with witnesses, having an expert witness look at it to to see if there was an OSHA violation there that, that we need to pursue in the workers' comp claim. And again, that definitely comes back into that, that ultimate financial determination. Uh, basically, the, the money you may get from having sustained this injury on the job. Correct. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's talk about this for a little bit. Uh, obviously, again, we're talking about a new facility being opened and some of the risk inherent there. It's not only new for the the management and the supervisors and the employees, but it's also new for the vendors. And at a lot of these large plants, it's not uncommon for deliveries to be made to the plant during not normal days and things like that, where everybody's up and going, and now all of a sudden you've got this extra truck on, or maybe you've got somebody else in the plant. And sometimes they can cause injuries as well. Those are, I think you call those third-party injuries. Let, let's talk about those a little bit. Right. Well, it can uh, cause a third-party uh, claim there. If you're injured on the job, uh, then you have a workers' compensation claim. Uh, if your injury on the job is caused by a coworker or caused by your employer doing something wrong, then that the workers' comp claim is all you have. You, your exclusive remedy against your employer in Kentucky is, and even a coworker is the workers' comp remedy that you have. In in workers' comp, the remedies are limited significantly over what you would have in a normal personal injury case. Uh, if the injury is caused by a vendor on the property uh, who you know may be moving something with a forklift, and they uh, and they hit you, then you could have a claim against that person driving the forklift and the company they work for. Uh, not only you also still have the workers' compensation claim, you also have the claim against them, and that that would open up uh, other avenues of damages that you can recover, uh, such as pain and suffering, which you cannot recover in a workers' compensation claim. Now the the damages that overlap medical expenses, for instance, because the workers' comp carrier pays for that, you can recover that against the other party. But if you do, the workers' comp carrier gets reimbursed that medical that they paid out of pocket. So you don't have a double recovery. It just opens up the avenue for the pain and sufferings and, and some other damages that you wouldn't have otherwise in a normal workers' compensation claim. And that's, you know, people kind of get confused on this. Well, I, I thought it was, I didn't know that was a delivery truck. I thought that was our truck or something like that. But I mean, really, to, to make this thing really stick in your mind, I mean, if you're walking to the cafeteria and you get hit by the UPS guy bringing something into, into the, uh, the shop, that's a third party. They're not normally there. That is a third party person who has basically injured you on, on the job, and the, and that's really kind of what we're talking about. Yeah, here. that's it. And, and also vendors that are there who get injured by the employees. So the the vendor then is the one who has the third party claim. I've I've handled several of those where you know, it may be uh, an electrician is in working on some uh, of the wiring or putting in some new equipment for a new line that's going to be opened up and then the the company employee hits them and, and you know one was in one that comes to mind the gentleman was in my client was in a a scissor lift uh, up working and a forklift uh, being driven by one of the employees of the company they were working at hit it knocked it knocked the scissor lift over and you know that that injured worker had the workers compensation claim but they also had the claim against that that company because of the negligence of their employee and so you could also have a, a situation where it's a lockout tagout situation where they've got some electrical work being done. Maybe they're putting in a new conveyor system or something like that, and they've they've turned off the electric, and suddenly it gets switched back on uh, improperly or out of sequence, 
and it causes an electrocution. I mean, you still these these things happen. I mean, these right. are normal. Uh, maybe they're doing. Maybe they're installing some new equipment, or maybe uh, some of the new equipment didn't work out, so they've got to replace it, so they don't lock off the area in terms of proper barriers, so they leave something open like a hole where they're they're digging somewhere. I mean, all of these things happen in in a plant. All of these ha- things happen on the job site. And they all qualify. Exactly. They would all qualify as a work-related injury and allow you to access the workers' comp benefits and, and potentially, if it's caused by someone else, a, a third-party claim. And, and it's just it's designed to make sure that you know the injured workers are getting properly treated, uh, how the income coming in, why they're off work, uh, and you know hopefully getting back into the workplace as quickly as they can. But then there's other... Other elements of damage, even under a workers' comp claim for permanent disability benefits and things of that uh, nature that you can recover in workers' comp. Well, Jeff, I mean, this is a complicated area of law. I mean, you, you do other things. You obviously do Social Security disability, and we've talked in, in other podcasts and other videos and other other uh, pages on the website about the fact that you may be off and you may have a Social Security claim that can be filed at the same time. Correct. Uh, you, you do a, a substantial personal injury practice. So, again, all of these things kind of roll together, and it's nice kind of having one person who's going to have all of the reports, all of the doctor's information, all of the testimonies and and, and communications going on that you can actually handle for that employee. So that's another reason to consider the, the, you know, Jeff Roberts, you know, here out of Murray, Kentucky, regardless of where you are in Kentucky. I mean, obviously you're getting called from all over the place anyway. Yeah, there there are, uh, you know, there are some attorneys who will handle a, personal injury claim, but they don't handle workers' comp, they don't handle Social Security disability cases. There are some attorneys who handle workers' compensation claim, but they don't handle personal injury cases or they don't handle Social Security disability. And certainly the the vast majority of my claims are, you know, it's a Social Security case or it's a workers' comp case or it's a personal injury case. But uh, there are situations where you've got a workers' comp and a personal injury case or you've got a workers' comp and a Social Security case, and it's f- frankly more financial financially feasible uh, or financially adv- advantageous for the client to have one attorney handling all of that because the cost of the medical records, if you've got two attorneys uh, getting medical records, two attorneys taking depositions, uh, you know, my, my fees are contingent upon recovery. I get paid my fee or my expenses are contingent upon recovery and fees are too. But uh, I get reimbursed those at the end of the case. Uh, but they're ultimately the client's responsibility if we are successful in the case, and it's going to be the same with the others. And so, you know, if you pay me to obtain the records one time, I can use that in two cases or three cases if we've got Social Security, personal injury, and workers' comp. Whereas if you're paying in a, two attorneys to get the exact same records, you know, the, the company copying those medical records is making more money from doing that. Uh, but but the the client's going to end up being the one who's paying for them twice in that situation. Right. It's just a lot more efficient if you've got one office that can do it all. Correct. And it seems like you, you've built a reputation here in Western Kentucky in particular of uh, having uh, done that for over, what, 27 years now? Tw- yeah, over 27 years now. And, and there's some interaction between all of those that have to be worked out. And, you know, I've, I've had... Uh, frequently have attorneys who are handling a personal injury claim who do not handle workers' comp, and they call me up and ask me to handle the workers' comp side of the case. And in that situation, you know, I coordinate with that attorney to make sure we're maximizing the recovery for the client in, in any interaction between those two is dealt with properly uh, from that standpoint. But if you know, if you got somebody who isn't that familiar with how that works, that can end up coming back and hurting the hurting the client. Now, most attorneys, hopefully most attorneys that are doing this have taken, have done the due diligence to learn the area of law like they should. Right. Well, and again, as we said from the outset, I mean, we're very, very fortunate here in Western Kentucky to have a lot of stuff opening up, not only just COVID plants that have been shut down now coming back up online, but also a lot of new investing uh, and investments that have been made here. So people are going to work. People are having good jobs out there. Uh, The issue is there's a learning period for everybody, and injuries are going to occur. And when they do, obviously you need an attorney who understands this area of law, who understands these rules, and understands the benefits that you deserve and that you're entitled to based on on the facts of your case. Um, Jeff, any closing thoughts as as we wrap up this episode? Uh, just a few. One, you know, I have people who, when they come to see me, a lot of times they're afraid of how their employer is going to react. Most large corporations understand that work injuries occur, 
and, and you know, even small operations understand that. And, and I've had you know, employers that I've talked to that said, you know, we want our client, we want our employees to be properly treated and get back to work. Uh, they're the lifeblood of the company, and you know, it's very rare to see retaliation against a, an injured worker for pursuing a worker's compensation claim, for contacting an attorney to help them pursue a worker's compensation claim. I won't say it never occurs, but it's, it's a rare occurrence, and it's against the law when it does occur, so that, that can actually uh, cause another lawsuit uh, to occur if they, if they do retaliate against someone from doing that. Uh, and you know, coming to see an attorney or talk to an attorney on the phone, you you can get an idea of what you're entitled to. You can learn what your rights are and then make an informed decision on whether you want to go forward with that case or not go forward with that case. And, you know, the insurance company knows the law. They know what you're entitled to. Uh, they're not going to voluntarily pay that to you as a general rule. But uh, they, they have someone who's trained, who's experienced in, in being advised by a lawyer, uh, helping them on their side of it, and at least it's my experience that the injured worker who has the same thing is going to be much happier with the end result uh, than the injured worker who does never uh, go to an attorney and then ends up losing valuable benefits like like future medical treatment. Right, we, which is, again, something you're entitled to, but if you don't know about it, uh, you may forego it by accident and, and not know you just gave away something that's going to be very valuable down the road. Exactly. If you have a, if you have to have a uh, cervical neck surgery uh, five years down the road, you know, that, that is an expensive surgery to have. And if it's from a work injury, even if, if you've let the statute of limitations go or you settled it without locking in the future medical, uh, most health insurance is, has a provision. They don't pay for work, uh, work-related work injuries, so that may be – you may not have any coverage for that at that point in time. Most people think, well, the health insurance will cover it. They may, but they may not. Well, and that brings up a good a, a good situation here in the fact that in, in Episode 5, you and your daughter Clarissa, who's actually a law student up at the University of Louisville, uh, we talked about a large article that you had published talking about the signing of, of medical releases, and that really goes right to what you just talked about, about uh, sometimes you're going to sign documents that are fairly complicated and they're complex on purpose, and if you don't understand what you're signing, you may forego some rights and benefits that you should have had in the first place. Uh, correct. Liability release, not yeah. a medical yeah. release that article is about. Yeah. Uh, but, yes, if you sign a settlement agreement, release settlement document of any sort, you need to understand what that uh, says and what you're giving up when you sign that document and make sure you're protecting uh, any future rights that you may have. It makes sense. Jeff, I want to thank you for your time. I know you're busy down here. I know your office is always humming every time we come down here to do these things. And I just I really appreciate what you've been doing over the years for all the people down here uh, in West Kentucky. I wish you the best. And uh, friends, if you're out there listening to this, we'll be back in about two weeks. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Roberts Law Office Injury Podcast. Jeff will return in two weeks. Until then, he invites you to visit jeffrobertslaw.com and follow his firm on Facebook. At the Roberts Law Office, you'll find a history of a small town service and big city results. Music